Greg's phone buzzed. He picked it up and read the incoming text. He dropped the phone on the bed. Hayley and Cyril looked from the phone to Greg. He pointed at it. When they leaned over to look at it, he looked too and read the text again. E-L. What's E-L? Cyril asked. Hayley went pale. He met Greg's wide-eyed gaze. Evil laugh, they said in unison. An animatronic dog that wanted to be helpful was one thing. An animatronic dog that wanted to be helpful and had a sense of humour was okay. But an animatronic dog who had an agenda, well, that was scary. After that, Greg stopped trying to get Hayley and Cyril to understand what he thought was going on with Fetch. So when they finished freaking out about Fetch, uh, Fetch's text, he told them he'd keep them posted and decided it was time to conduct more experiments. Going to the abandoned restaurant in itself had been a test and he still wasn't sure how that had turned out. It had started with him putting an, in an intention out, a desire backed by his will that it, that it unfold. That had led to an impulse to act. The impulse had taken him to the restaurant where he found Fetch. But how did Fetch play into the grand scheme of things? He had to figure it out. He decided to start with something small and specific. The next day, he got his first experiment's result. In advanced scientific theory, Mr. Jacoby, looking even more nerdy than usual in a blue checkered short-sleeved shirt under a red and blue argyle uh, sweater vest, started his lecture with, so now that we understand the zero point field, let's see if we can figure out what it means for the real world. To this end, we're going to talk about REGs. Awesome, Greg thought. A random event generator, usually referred to as an REG, Mr. Jacoby said, is a machine that basically flips a coin. Not really, of course, but it's a machine that's designed to generate a random output, just the same as you'd get by flipping a coin, assuming you're not cheating at it. Mr. Jacoby grinned, then continued. Instead of heads or tails, REGs produce a positive or negative pulse and then turn the pulses into ones and zeros, which as you know, is binary code, the language of computers. Once the pulses are in binary code, they can be stored and counted. Researchers built the REGs as a way of studying the impact that focused thought, that focused thought has on events. Make sense? Greg nodded, and he noticed Kimberly did as well. Excellent. Mr. Jacoby clapped his hands once. So, I was able to get a small REG, and now it's time to do some intention experiments with it. I'm assigning partners. Greg held his breath. Will it work? He only had to wait through two pairings to find out. Greg and Kimberly, Mr. Jacoby said. Pair up. Kimberly turned gracefully in her chair, her hair sweeping through the air like she was in a shampoo commercial. She smiled at Greg, and his bones nearly disintegrated. He had to clutch the lab table to stay in his seat. His intention had worked. Grinning back at Kimberly and waving at her so exuberantly that her own smile faltered a little, Greg forced himself to stay seated. He had enough wits about him to know that if he did a happy dance, he'd be laughed at for years. Mr. Jacoby made everyone move around so partners were seated together. He instructed them to exchange phone numbers because they need to stay in contact. Greg had to concentrate to keep his hand steady when he passed his phone to Kimberly and took her phone, tucked into a bright purple case to enter his number. After they returned each other's phones and Mr. Jacoby started explaining the experiment's instructions, Greg's phone buzzed and, per class rules, he ignored it. It wasn't until he was out in the hall, after he and Kimberly set a time to meet to do the first step of the experiment, that he checked his phone. Fetch had text. Congrats. At the end of the day, Greg couldn't wait to get home to record the triumph in his journal. Unfortunately, he'd missed the bus that morning, and he'd had to bike to school. That wasn't a problem, but now the wind was blowing from the southeast, and he couldn't bike hard enough to overcome the gusts trying to shove him back toward the school. Eventually, he gave up and walked his bike the rest of the way to his house. He was so lost in thought, he forgot about the tiny terror that lived next door. It was like a rabid, furry missile was careening toward him at top speed. He nearly jumped to Mars when the dog launched itself from an outdoor table and threw itself over the fence right at him. Crap! He let go of his bike and dropped his backpack, catching the dog just as it hit his chest and started snapping at his jugular. What was it with, these, with this dog? On reflex, 
he pushed the dog back over the short fence. When the dog hit the ground, it came up barking and snarling and it flung itself against the wooden boards. Greg didn't wait to see what it would do next. He grabbed his bike and backpack and ran for his house. Once inside, he realised he was hyperventilating, sinking to the floor in the puddle created by his dripping coat. He texted Haley, Devil dog just tried to slash my throat. Scared the hell out of me. You okay? Haley responded. Shaken, not stirred. Haley texted back. Lol. That night, Greg had nightmares. Not a surprise. He spent the whole night in the abandoned pizzeria being chased alternately by Fetch, a faceless man, and the dog next door, while plants grew so fast inside the restaurant that the place turned into a jungle. On the stage, an REG spewed out what, uh, zeros and ones, almost too fast for the eye to register. Greg woke up covered in sweat. Did the dream mean it was working or not? Shaking off the bad night, Greg scowled out the window at the sideways rain. More wind? Apparently Dare was right about this year's winter storms. He threw on some clothes quickly, already late for school. Racing to the door, Greg waved at his mom, who was on the phone. He ignored his dad, who was scowling at a, at a spreadsheet on his laptop while he guzzled coffee. Greg threw on his rain jacket, grabbed his backpack, and went out the door and down the steps. That's where he came to a stop. So abrupt, he lost his balance and had to grab the stair railing. His eyes widened, his pulse rate flew into overdrive, and his stomach clenched. This couldn't be happening. Turning away from what was in front of him, Greg staggered to the nearest bush and threw up. All he had in his stomach was water, which came up, along with yellow bile. Then, even though his stomach was empty, it lurched some more and he endured a couple rounds of dry heaves. Finally, he collapsed onto the bottom step of the stairs and wiped his mouth. His fingers were stiff and cold. He took several deep breaths, cringing at the sour smell of his vomit and the stench coming from next to his bike. Greg stood. He didn't want to stand, and his legs felt so weak it was clear they weren't on board with the idea either. But he had to do something before his parents came out. Looking around wildly, as if someone might appear to help him, which actually was the last thing he wanted, he tried to figure out what to do. Well, he knew what he had to do. He had to move it, which meant he had to touch it. No way was he going to touch it. He smacked himself on the forehead. Think, dummy! The admonition worked. He dug his keys out of his pocket and strode to the garden shed tucked against the back of his house. Dropping his keys twice before he could get the right one on the lock, he was drenched by the time he stepped inside the shed and retrieved the black plastic garbage bag he was after. Now that he was in action, he moved at hyperspeed. He slammed and locked the shed door, not worrying about the sound because the wind and rain drowned out everything. He raced back to his bike. And once again, he had to confront what he didn't want to look at. This time, he made himself look, really look. The neighbor's dog lay dead against the back wheel of Greg's bike tire, its throat torn apart, its belly gutted, intestines flopping onto the concrete. It was stiff and its eyes were wide open, as if staring in fear, maybe for the first and last time of its life. Greg forced himself to examine the dog's fatal wounds. Yeah, it's just what his subconscious mind told him in the first glance. The dog hadn't been killed with a knife or some other sharp object. It had been ferociously ripped by teeth and claws. It had been attacked by another animal. Greg gagged and swallowed down another dry heave. Breathing through his mouth, he opened the plastic bag and put it down over the dog. Once he had it covered, he slipped the bag under the animal and used the plastic to scoop up the entrails. When he had it all, he carried the bag to the bushes between his and his neighbour's house and emptied it into the bushes. The dog fell with a sickening splat onto the ground. Greg looked up at his house to be sure neither of his parents were looking out the window. Nope, all good. The neighbour's house was one story. They couldn't see into his yard, and this part of the yard was sheltered from the street. No one was watching him. Even so, this probably wasn't the best plan in the world. But it was the best he had. If the dog was a human, forensics would point to Greg in a nanosecond. But the corpse was a dog. He didn't figure there'd be much of an investigation when the body was found. It looked like the nasty little thing had been mauled by a coyote. But it hadn't been. As much as he'd loved to convince himself that 
that's what happened. Greg knew no coyote would uh, would kill a dog and then pose it next to Greg's bike because the dog had clearly been posed. Although a little blood from the dog's neck and intestines strained the concrete next to Greg's tire, it wasn't nearly enough blood for, savage, for the savagery of the dog's wounds. The dog must have been killed someplace else. No, coyotes had nothing to do with the dog's death. Greg realised he was frozen in place by the bush. He wadded up the plastic bag, trotted to the trash bin under his house, and stuffed it inside one of the bags of kitchen trash. He closed the lid. That's when his phone buzzed. He didn't want to look at it, but he had to. The incoming text was, as Greg knew it would be, from Fetch. Y. W. Greg was still staring at the screen when another text came in, this one from Heidi. W. R. U. He should have been at Haley's house to catch the bus there five minutes ago. He quickly texted, sorry, late. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming this means you're welcome. This means where are you if you don't, if you don't know text talk. That they use text talk like a lot. I don't understand why people do that because it's really confusing. <laughs> like who uses WRU instead of where are you? It's, it's literally easier to communicate with the words where are you, but anyway. And, and like eight instead of an A-T-E. It's like weird. Uh, then he grabbed his bike and pedaled out into the rain, hoping that the wind at his back would help him get to Hades before the bus arrived. Greg spent the day paying very little attention to what was going on around him. Every chance he got, he pulled out his phone and scrolled back to delete old text messages. The spider had spooked him, but the dead dog had terrified him. Fetch had killed the dog to help Greg. What other help would Fetch try to offer? It didn't take long after finding the dog for Greg to conclude that Fetch could do all kinds of nasty things with what Greg had said he wanted. So he tried to find any text in which he suggested he wanted or needed anything, but the problem was Fetch seemed to be doing more than accessing old messages or conversations. Fetch seemed to be listening in to Greg's life. How? Greg needed to talk to Heidi and Cyril. He needed their help. Unfortunately, Two days passed before he was able to convince Hadey and Cyril to help him do what he needed, he, what he knew he needed to do. He wasn't able to tell them about the neighbor's dog until after school. Predictably, they were freaked. Cyril wanted to forget it as soon as he heard it. Hadey, though, wanted to see the stiff. So he followed. So he followed Greg home, and they stood together in the rain, staring at the dead dog, which was now a wet, grisly pile of viscera and fur. I want to go back to the restaurant, Greg told Hadey once they were up in Greg's room. Hadey stared at him. After that, he waved a hand in the direction of where the dog, dead dog lay. You want to go back? Well, want is probably not the right word, but I need to. I have to know what's going on. Hadey shook his head and said he was going home. But Greg was persistent. He hounded Hadey and Cyril relentlessly via text that evening and in person, the next morning and on the phone, the next afternoon. Uh until he convinced them to return to the restaurant with him. After school, they huddled together in the school lobby before racing through the rain to their bus. It will still be raining tonight, Greg told them. Fewer people out. Yeah, whatever, Hady said. We're going to die, Cyril said. Greg laughed. We're not going to die. So why was his stomach doing somersaults? And why had his heart relocated to his throat? It was a little hard to get away from their families on a Wednesday night, but they managed it by saying they were going to do homework together at Greg's house. His parents, per usual, were out. His mum had taken a part-time job as a front desk clerk at one of the hotels. He wasn't sure what that was about, and he didn't ask. His dad was working late on his most recent build. I hate the finishing work, he'd complained that morning. That's when the client always gets nit nitpicky. The first time they'd gone to the restaurant, Greg and his friends had been armed only with a crowbar and flashlights. This time, they also each brought along kitchen knives, and Haley stuck his baseball bat, bat in his backpack. It was just as easy to break into the restaurant the second time, actually even easier. The service door lock they'd broken hadn't been repaired or replaced. They just had to pull the heavy door open and slip through. Once inside, they flipped on their flashlights and shined them around. They started with the ground. Clearly, they all had the same idea. They were looking for footprints other than theirs in the dust covering the cracked blue linoleum floor. Unfortunately, they'd 
scuffed up the dust so much on their first trip, it was impossible to tell for sure whether anyone else had been here. Do we have a plan? Cyril asked when they moved out into the hallway. Greg noticed all three of them were breathing fast. His voice sounded breathless when he said, I think we should start by finding Fetch. They walked shoulder to shoulder along the hallway. It was much quieter in the building this time because the rain, although steady, was soft. It was foggy too. That tended to dampen sounds. So I found out something about the restaurant, Cyril said. His voice sounded too loud and too forced. What? Hedy asked. This is part of a pizza chain that closed down after something happened at one of them. What happened? Greg asked. I don't know. It took a lot of time to even find what I found. I just found a reference to it on a message board for people who like to explore abandoned places. Hedy came to a dead stop, his flashlight beam jittering out onto the floor in front of him. What? Cyril asked. Greg looked along the illuminated shaft of Hedy's light. Cyril squealed. Greg couldn't blame him. Dog tracks came out of the pizzeria's eating area and headed toward the lobby. What the? Hades still hadn't budged. You did turn it on, Cyril said to Greg. Yeah, way to go, dude, Hades said. Before Greg could respond, a clatter and crash came from inside one of the closed doorways along the hall. Cyril squealed again. Hades dropped his flashlight. We need to see what's in those rooms, Greg said. Hades retrieved his flashlight and shined it in Greg's face. Greg squeezed his eyes shut and turned away. Are you out of your mind? Hedy asked. Probably, but I have to know what's going on. I'm going to check it out. You don't have to if you don't want to. I don't want to, Cyril said. Fine. Greg dug the crowbar out of his backpack, looked at the knife, and concluded that he didn't have enough hands to hold a crowbar, a knife, and his flashlight. So, he got a firm grip on both crowbar and flashlight, then took five steps toward the nearest closed door. He noticed a small sign he'd missed the last time. It read control room. He stuck the, the crowbar under his arm and reached for the doorknob. Hedy appeared at his side. Can't let you go in there alone, dude. He produced the baseball bat from his backpack and gripped it hard. Cyril scurried ho over. I'm not waiting out here by myself. Thanks, Greg said. He turned the knob, took a breath and threw the door open. He quickly rearmed himself with the crowbar. All three flashlight beams sliced through the dusty blackness and revealed a bank of old computer monitors, keyboards, and what looked like control panels filled with dials and knobs. Nothing else was in the room. I don't see anything that could have made that sound, Hedy said. Greg nodded. Let's try the next room. Wait, Hedy crossed to the nearest keyboard and tapped keys. He turned a couple of dials on the control panels. Nothing happened, he shrugged. Had to check. Cyril, gaining courage from his friend, came further into the room and tapped and pushed buttons too. Still nothing happened. Greg left the room and headed to the next closed door. As he figured they would, his friends followed. This door was marked security and the room behind it was similar to the first one. More dated computer monitors looked back at the boys blankly. Nothing worked. One last closed door. This one was labelled storage. The sound must have come from in here. Greg said. He reached for the knob, but Cyril grabbed his arm. Wait! Greg looked at Cyril. You never told us what you wanted to do here. Why are we here? Yeah, dude, Hedy agreed. You kept saying you had to see. See what? Fetch? What are you going to do to him when you see him? Interrogate, interrogate him? Reason with him? He's a piece of machinery. Yeah, Cyril said. And when we left him, he wasn't in here. He wasn't in there. He pointed to the door. Greg didn't know how to explain why he needed to be here. I have to know whether someone else was here and is pranking us, and if it's fetch, I want to see how it's working. He didn't bother explaining why he had to look in this room. Before they could protest again, he opened the door, and he fell back into his friends. Cyril screamed, Hedy gasped. Staring back at the boys in the gleaming streams of their lights were four life-sized animatronic characters. They were at least five times bigger than Fetch, who was about the size of a beagle. Greg recovered himself first. He aimed his light around the room. Every time the beam landed on something, Greg's breath caught. The room didn't just house the four characters. It was also filled with animatronic parts and character costumes, a whole wardrobe of them. 
Dozens of pairs of sightless eyes stared at them through the flashlight transected gloom. Or at least Greg hoped they were sightless. His friends hadn't spoken since they opened the door. Suddenly, a raspy humming sound filled the room. The boys' lights skittered all over the space, searching for the sound's origin. One of the animatronic characters seemed to move its leg, and then something small, dark and furry shot out from behind it, arced toward the boys, barked, and then bolted out of the room, before they could do more than gasp in union. Whatever it was disappeared from view. Sybil shrieked and tore from the room. Greg and Haley were at his heels. This wasn't a thinking moment. That was Fetch that had leaped out of that room, wasn't it? Ha had to be. Even though Haley or Greg could have hit Fetch, or whatever that thing was, with the baseball bat or crowbar, Greg's brain didn't even consider that. Apparently Hades didn't either. They had just one conscious idea in their heads. Run. As they dashed down the hallway toward their exit, Greg tried not to hear the growling and chloric tapping that followed them. He also firmly closed the door on his mind when it asked to uh, when it tried to ask questions about how fetch no no not going there get out get out get out that was the only agenda it took them only seconds to reach the door and squeeze through it cyril in the lead and greg bringing up the rear was that a nip at his heel right before he pulled his foot through and shut the door not going there either without speaking the boys grabbed their bikes but just as they did a whine behind them made them pause with a shaking hand Greg aimed his flashlight at the pizzeria. A wet, stray mutt trotted toward them, but when Cyril yelped in fear, the dog veered away into the fir trees that surrounded the abandoned building. It wasn't Fetch. Greg let go of his bike. I don't care, Cyril said. I do, Greg said. I want to find Fetch and figure out what, what he's doing. I'm going back in. I'm going home, Cyril said. Haley looked from Greg to Cyril and back again. Greg shrugged, albeit a little shakily, and headed toward the pizzeria. You can't go in there alone. Haley let go of his bike too, and followed Greg. He looked at Cyril. The real dog made that noise we heard, and probably the tracks too. Cyril hugged himself, then sighed. If I die, I'm going to come back and kill you both. That's fair, Greg said. The boys re-entered the pizzeria. They stuck close together as they went down the hall, closing the storage room door as they went past. Without speaking, they made their way to the dining area, their flashlight beam zooming this way and that like spotlights. They crossed the room to the prize counter. They only got halfway there before they all paused. They didn't have to get any closer to see what they came to see. Fetch was no longer on the counter. Greg flipped his beam on to the floor, and then all around the prize counter, no fetch. Maybe he fell behind the counter, Hades suggested, not sounding particularly convinced of his theory. Maybe. Since neither of his friends moved, Greg took a huge breath and shuffled forward. Let me know if you see anything, he told his friends. You've got your back, Hades said. Greg wasn't so sure, but he had to know if Fetch was there. Ignoring the trickle of sweat that ran down between his shoulder blades, Greg reached the counter and started tiptoeing on it or tiptoeing around it. Dude, Haley said, don't you think he would have heard us by now? Greg flinched. Good point, he laughed, but the sound was more of a croak when it came out. So he rushed around the counter and threw his light beam everywhere it could reach. Fetch wasn't there. Greg turned and looked at his friends. Fetch is gone. What are you going to do? Cyril asked. I'm not sure, Greg confessed. Haley, ever the optimist, jumped in. What if you text us? text him to stop or to leave you alone he has to listen to you right it's in his programming tried that greg sighed didn't work could you give him an impossible task cyril asked something that could occupy his time forever like what i don't know i'm just trying to find an easy there is no easy solution greg snapped i just need time to think as a unit the boys headed back out the way they came in uh, no one suggested looking around more. Not even Greg. None of them spoke. They just went back outside, got on their bikes, and pedalled hard into fog that was now so thick the restaurant disappeared into it. They pedalled in silence, only broken by the pattering rain, the swooshing sound of their wheels on the wet pavement, and their panting breath. At the corner where they normally stopped to say goodbye before biking on to their re respective houses, 
No one even slowed. They all just headed for home. Greg understood. None of them were ready to talk about what had just happened. Greg wasn't sorry to get home and find his parents were still out. He was, in fact, relieved they didn't see him. When he looked at himself in the bathroom mirror, he was so pale his features almost disappeared into the blank whiteness of his face. A long, hot shower brought colour back into his skin, and it brought conscious back uh, thought. It's oh, sorry. It brought conscious thought back into his mind. Where was Fetch? Even though he knew Fetch would have had to leave the restaurant to dig up the spider and kill the neighbor's dog, Greg had convinced himself Fetch went back to the restaurant when his duty was done. The idea of him uh, being out there, somewhere, lurking. The hair on the back of Greg's neck prickled. Suddenly remembering his phone, he stared at the green sweats he'd left... Sweats? Green sweats he'd left crumpled on the floor. His phone was in one of the pockets. Oh, okay. Taking a long breath, he bent over and retrieved the phone, checking for the missed texts. Sure enough, there was Fetch's last, latest text. Hope to see you soon. Yeah, well, I don't hope to see you soon, Greg muttered. Greg didn't allow himself to ask all the questions that wanted to be asked after their latest encounter with Fetch. Instead, he decided to concentrate on school for a change, specifically on Spanish. Oh god, here we go again. <laughs> if he didn't get on top of his Spanish homework, he was going to fail the class. So, on Saturday morning, he texted Manuel, asking if he had time to, to help him. Manuel didn't respond. Greg shrugged. Okay, so he'd have to muddle through on his own. He opened his Spanish workbook and picked up his pencil. Then, he snapped his pencil in half when he realised what he'd just done. Oh no! Greg shouted. He jumped up. He had to get to... Crap! He didn't know where he needed to go. Greg grabbed his phone and called Cyril. I'm not going back there, Cyril said. That's not what I'm calling. Do you know where Manuel lives? Sure. He's about half a mile up the street from me. That's how we met. He gave Greg an address. Why do you need... I've got to go. Sorry, I'll explain later. Greg shoved his phone in his pocket and tore out of his house. Grabbing his bike, he ignored the steady mist and pedaled as hard as he could. Greg nearly collapsed in horror when he got to Manuel's house and saw that the front door was wide open. Was he too late? Right after he texted Manuel, he'd realised Fetch could have interrupt, uh, in, sorry, interpreted that text as instruction to retrieve Manuel. Given what Fetch had done to the neighbour's dog, Greg was afraid Fetch might punish Manuel for not being available to help Greg. Or worse, Fetch might kill Manuel and drag his body to Greg's house. There was no telling what the animatronic beast was capable of. Dropping his bike on the concrete driveway, Greg ran to the gaping doorway and peered into the tile-covered entryway of the small one-storey house. He broke out in a cold sweat when he saw muddy paw prints on the grey squares. Manuel? He shouted, taking a step into the house. Que pasa? <laughs> a voice called from behind Greg. A dog barked. <clears throat> uh, Greg whirled around. Manuel and a yellow Labrador were standing at the edge of a front yard filled with patches of grass and exposed dirt. The dog had a red ball in its mouth and its feet were muddy. Greg's heart, which had been trying to set a speed record, settled into a more normal pace. Hey Manuel. Hi Greg. Manuel's smile was friendly but confused. Not a surprise. How could Greg explain why he was here? Um, I, I sent you a text, but you didn't respond. Needed a bike ride anyway, so I thought I'd stop by. Cyril told me you lived down the street from him. I wondered if you have any time to help me with my Spanish. Manuel's confusion disappeared. Sure. Sorry about the text. I left my phone inside. I can do it now, if Oro will let us. I think that means gold? Does that mean gold in Spanish? I don't know. Uh, the dog next to him barked. Greg, so relieved that he'd imagined danger that didn't exist, grinned at the dog. Hi, Oro. Want me to throw the ball? Oro wagged his tail, but didn't move. Manuel laughed. He understands Spanish. Say, traem la pelota. Traem la pelota. Oh, gosh. Traem la pelota. There we go. I don't know if I'm pronouncing the A right, because it's got an accent. Anyway, Greg repeated the command. Oro brought him the ball. Greg laughed. Maybe I don't need your help. 
Maybe Oro can help me. Manuel laughed too, and for the next hour, Greg forgot all about Fetch while he played with Oro and improved his Spanish. The rest of the weekend passed without any disturbing incidents, and when Monday came, Greg was in a great mood. He was all about his most recent triumph, getting Kimberly as his lab partner. He'd intended it. It had happened. And after his most recent intention with Fetch seemed to seemed to thwart him, it looked like Greg was sorry, was actually learning to use the zero point field. Score. Greg and Kimberly had their first meetup after school the next day in the science lab. Every team had been given a set time to use the REG machine Mr. Jacoby got for his for, for their experiments. Greg and Kimberly were second to use the machine. Their assignment was to attempt to control, with their minds, the zeros and ones generated by the machine. Both were to focus their will on either zeros or ones. Greg took zeros and Kimberly took ones. For a total of 10 minutes each, they were to record their results, and then they were supposed to write a paper about some aspect of REG research and how it impacted society. Greg had thought he'd have to be the one to suggest a topic, but Kimberly beat him to it. Sitting cross-legged on the floor after they used the REG machine, Kimberly said, I have an idea for the paper. She pulled out her phone and tapped at it. Greg stared at her hands. She had the prettiest hands. Today, her nails were bright blue. They matched the tight blue sweater she wore. He tried not to stare. Are you listening? I'm sorry, what? Even though Greg had known Kimberly for seven years, he was pretty sure he'd never said more than two words to her at a time. Whenever he had the chance to talk to her, his brain drained down his legs and puddled in his shoes. He'd gotten her as a partner now, but now was he going to talk to her? I said, I think we should write about how REGs influence big world disasters. Wow, she knew that. If he hadn't been in love before, he sure was now. Yeah, he agreed. That's perfect. You know about it? She looked up at him. Greg still sat in his chair but now he slid down onto the beige tiled floor so he could see her better. Stoked by her idea, he forgot to be nervous. Yeah, I've been following the way REGs have been used to study the power of thinking for a couple of years. That's Gucci! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot that they, they referenced Gucci in this story. That's great. That's Gucci. Kimberly gave him one of her four smiles. He grinned back like an idiot. He was so excited about her paper topic that he wasn't as bummed about the fact that Kimberly had done better with the REG machine than he had. No matter how much he concentrated, his machine's results were barely above a normal random readout. I tried to talk to my parents about it, Kimberly said. They're pretty open-minded, but mum said it was too out there and dad said the machines were probably being set up to get the results the people wanted, but they're not. Kimberly leaned forward, her eyes bright. Greg couldn't believe she was as into this stuff as he was. I know, Greg said, leaning in too. And did you know, they get spikes before big sporting events. He hesitated only a second before saying, Do you know about Cleve ba Baxter? Kimberly blinked. No, who's he? He was an interrogation instructor for the CIA, and he taught classes on using the polygraph machine. Okay, Kimberly put her elbows on her knees, clearly focused on what he was saying. He couldn't believe he had her full attention. He tried not to let himself be distracted by her peaches and cream perfume. So, what about him? Kimberly prompted. Greg cleared his throat. Well, he started using the polygraph machine to do experiments on plants, and he discovered plants can sense our thoughts. My mother sings to her plants because she says it makes them grow faster. Greg nodded. They probably do. That's why I was surprised my mum didn't believe the REG stuff. I think it freaks people out, Greg said. Kimberly nodded. So, is there any more about this polygraph guy? Yeah, so Baxter experimented with a plant's reactions to his actions. Like, he burnt a plant and got a reaction, but not just in the burnt plant. Nearby plants reacted too. And then he just thought about burning the plants, and the second he had that thought, the polygraph recorded a reaction in all the plants. Like the plants had read his mind. Whoa. Greg nodded so hard he felt like a bobblehead doll. Yeah, I know, he grinned. Most people didn't believe Baxter when he published his results, but he kept experimenting, not only with plants, but with human cells, and he proved that cells can sense thoughts. They have consciousness. 
Kimberly twirled a lock of her shiny hair with an index finger. So if cells have consciousness, then why is it such a leap to think our brains can influence a machine? Exactly. We should include that in our paper, Kimberly said. It's good stuff. Yeah, I thought it was so cool that I decided to do my own experiments. My uncle got me a polygraph machine and I started trying things with my plants. It actually works. They know what I'm thinking. Well, at least the simple stuff. Wow. Yeah, I've been trying other things too. Greg hesitated. Should he tell her? Like what? She asked. Greg chewed his lip. Oh, why not? He scooted closer to her and lowered his voice. Do you remember what Mr. Jacoby said about the zero point field? That it means no all, that it means all matter in the universe is interconnected by subatomic waves that connect one part of the universe to every other part. Yeah, sure. Well, I read about the field over the summer. And when I read it, I got really excited. I read that researchers are saying this field could explain lots of stuff no one could explain before. Stuff like Kai and telepathy and other psychic abilities. I have a cousin who's psychic, uh, <laughs> uh, Kimberly said. She always knows when there's going to be a test at her school. Kimberly laughed. I've been trying to get her to teach me how to do that. Greg grinned. Then you'll get it. Get what? Well, I have some good stuff in my life, but there's so much I hate. Like my dad and, well, just stuff. So I figured I could use to, I, I could learn to use the field, you know, communicate with it, tell it what I want and get it to tell me what to do. So I've been practicing on my plants, seeing if they'd respond to my intention. And then I started just concentrating on things I wanted and seeing if I got any ideas, you know, like guidance. Yeah. Kimberly slowly nodded. I get what you're trying to do. She wrinkled up her perfect nose. The problem is, well, she shrugged. I just wonder if trying to get the field to work is like a monkey trying to fly an aeroplane. He's going to crash and burn before he can figure it out. Greg tried not to let her see that her words felt like a kitten, kick in the gut. She obviously did see though. Not that you're a monkey, I mean, I just mean quantum stuff is hard. I like it too, and I've tried to read about it, but I don't get it. Not really. Hey! Trent White burst into the room. You two smashing face in here or what? <laughs> I don't know why I gave him that really strong British accent. <laughs> uh, Kimberly blushed deep red. Shut up, Trent, Greg said. Shut up yourself. Your time's up. Our turn. Uh, Trent gestured toward his project partner, another school athlete, Rory. Greg still couldn't believe they were both in advanced scientific theory. We're done. Kimberly scrambled to her feet. She and Greg left the room. Let's get together over the weekend to talk more about the paper, she suggested. Sure, 